Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. This is another podcast for the Beyond the Mekong program and published by The Diplomat. With me today is Nico Mesterham. Nico is the director of Meta House, uh, arts production house in uh, Phnom Penh, where he has, my God, Nico, you've produced a couple of hundred movies, scripts, plays, workshops, art exhibitions. You've backed famous photographers like uh, Tim Page, Phil Jones Griffithson. There's been a lot of artists that I'm thinking of, say, Sotebi Ur, who uh, uh, started out from nowhere and is now quite a well-known artist in Europe. Welcome to the program. Yeah, welcome, Luke, and thanks for inviting me. Arts and funding and getting money to back projects, it's not what it was. When I came to Cambodia in, in 2000, I came as a filmmaker. For the first seven years, I just um, produced documentaries, mainly for German and European cultural TV. Um, and because I did that, I met many um, players in the cultural field. Yep. And when I started Meta House in 2007, uh, funding was a problem. Uh, so we did that in the beginning by ourselves with a little bit of seed money. And if I say a little bit, I mean it was possibly 1,000, 2,000 US. We right. opened the center in our private house, me and my wife, she's a Cambodian filmmaker. And we had no funding. Um, but then starting possibly from 2008, 2009, when uh, the country and the city of Phnom Penh developed, uh, it got much easier and there were moments where there was a lot of money uh, in the NGO sector for media productions, media workshop, um, art um, projects with a focus of on democracy, um, uh, social imbalances, environment and so on. Female empowerment has always been a strong suit with uh, Meta House. Yeah, that's right, because when I came, I, I was surprised about the level of empowerment or the non-level of empowerment that I saw here um, in Cambodia. Um, on one hand, it seemed that Cambodian women were deprived of their rights. On the other hand, um, the local women here are quite strong. So there was kind of an imbalance in between what you saw in public and what you heard in households. And I always felt that it is important to give uh, women a voice also in public. So lots of our projects, they centered around uh, female artists, female filmmakers, and sure, women empowerment workshops targeting topics such as sexual violence, domestic violence, um, mm -hmm. uh, arranged marriages and such. The dynamics of funding has changed. The political situation has not been the best since 2016, 2017. There are signs that that is easing up. And one gets the impression that Western donors in particular, they just don't really care about Cambodia. It's not on their radar the way it once was. Yeah, it's actually a shame. I think that people in Western countries, the, the donors, the people with the money who decide upon grants from uh, far away offices compared to where we're at now in Phnom Penh, they um, bring in their own agendas, they bring in uh, their own ideas, and they um, possibly sometimes don't know about the realities on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, it was easier to get funding before the political landscape here in Cambodia changed, before Cambodia became basically a one-party a state, and before uh, the advent of the Chinese. And COVID. And COVID. And, and the Russian invasion of Ukraine seemed to result in a, a massive shift in terms of funding and focus from Western countries where Cambodia just seemed to have been left behind. That's right. And, and now it, it looks exactly like that in the moment. Um, we're having uh, uh, two uh, big wars going on, one in Ukraine, one in Gaza. We are um, here in a in a country where uh, the uh, where there is not so much economical interest by Western countries, mm -hmm. um, except maybe uh, if it's about um, uh, importing. But it is very difficult nowadays to get funding 
we had um, donors a while ago who uh, left the country, who stopped the operation of programs in Cambodia. Uh, our own, I mean, the German Cultural Foundation Goethe Institute has uh, just cut in the last year 60% of the funding. So we are now basically left with a bare minimum. And honestly, it looks like um, this situation and uh, the condition we are in in the moment cries for a rearrangement, a refocusing, possibly um, a shift in approaches. So what I want to say is, in the moment, many cultural places, many arts activists, many filmmakers, they have to really look into commercial opportunities versus the previous funding opportunities from international donors. You've got a couple of big projects on the go at the moment, including uh, Fraternal Help, which is, uh, I, I think, an extraordinary movie that should be released, I guess, late towards the end of next year. When you first arrived here almost 20 years ago, the uh, cultural landscape was bare. We're still living in an era where the history of this country had been totally stripped by the Khmer Rouge and 30 years of war. And what's been put together since then, much of that has emerged out of Meta House. And uh, fraternal help, I think, is a big step forward. Um, East Germany, access to uh, archives. Well, look, you, again, I'm a German. So when I arrived in Cambodia in, in 2000, um, I was surprised as a West Berliner coming from what was once what the, the West of Germany in a um, Cold War world where two Germanys existed. And I was surprised to see uh, what the GDR that ceased to exist in 1989 had done here in Cambodia alongside other socialist countries in the 1980s at times when the Western world would not help Cambodia because uh, the country was occupied by the Vietnamese um, and um, supported by other socialist communist countries. For me, it was an eye-opener. I met here in Cambodia really early. Cambodians who had studied in the GDR or had attended vocational training there, these amounted to around 4,000. So I met a few of them here and in 2007 when I established Matter House, what was then called the Cambodian German Cultural Center, I understood that these 4,000 Cambodians who had been in the 80s in East Germany, they were kind of a, a core group for what we were about to do. If you would want to connect uh, Cambodia and Germany, you were looking for cultural connections, they were there with these people, with these 4,000 Cambodians who studied in the GDR. As the topic of GDR is not super popular in reunified, West, uh, reunified Germany anymore, we um, had a hard time, Matterhaus had a hard time finding funding for that project because also it shows actually the GDR foreign policy in quite a favorable light. Mm -hmm. compared to the foreign policy in the 80s of West Germany that would hold the seat in the UN General Assembly for Pol Pot as legitimate leader of Cambodia. Uh, the GDR uh, assisted the young Cambodian state then, occupied by the Vietnamese, and helped to build it up again, to rebuild it. So I, I felt that this is a good story. This is a good story not only for Cambodians to watch, but also for young Germans who, as it is here with the genocide in Cambodia, know little about um, German history. So to do this film project, Fraternal Help, we went a long way. I researched it for 10 years. I almost a little bit too long. Many of the time witnesses, especially the diplomats, are dead already. So we have to work with the time witnesses which are still alive and willing to talk. But this film is supposed to be released um, 
in April 2025, coinciding with the uh, 50th anniversary of the ascension uh, of Pol Pot and of the Khmer Rouge to power in uh, 1975. Right, and as I understand it, you've had access to uh, East German archival footage, which has never been seen before. That's right. Being being German, I tell you, compared to contemporary Cambodia, we are very good with archives. So um, the uh, East German media archive was brought in part into what is called the German radio archive. And there sits a plethora of TV reports, uh, TV documentaries, mm -hmm. newsreels, and so on that deal with... Uh, Cambodia from the 1960s up until today, we picked and we had a look at the archives uh, from West and East German uh, public TV, uh, especially from the 60s, uh, 70s and 80s. Right. And I must say that I saw so many interesting things that I found so many... Um, clips and films, uh, sure, um, often still in black and white, which are uh, documenting a part of history that I hadn't seen before. There's lots of uh, clips that uh, depict uh, daily life uh, from then how it was. Uh, we see uh, the building of the Independence Monument. There right. is lots of stuff that has never been used. Right. And and because, again, when the GDR was over in 1989, many people just didn't look back. So I, I guess that most of these archives they have never looked at right. in the last uh, 30 years. With the occupation of Cambodia by the Khmer Rouge or their reign of terror between uh, 1975 and the end of 1978, a lot of those governments were sort of hands in the air. We didn't know. Oh, really? Oh, my God. What happened there kind of thing? The evidence you've uncovered, how soon after 1975 do you think the West Germans were aware of what was actually occurring here? This is an interesting question. I think one can assume that um, people in governmental service the circles and the secret services in West and East Germany in both countries at that time, they had information coming in. Refugees talk. There was also, you remember, there was a book about genocide done by a French priest that was disputed, especially by the international left. Uh, Sartre, they didn't, uh, Chomsky, they didn't believe it. They, they, yeah, they didn't want to believe they that didn't their own kind could do this. No. But I, I think that, that also the, the GDR Secret Service became aware of atrocities as early as 76. However, in both countries, in West Germany and in East Germany, up until the fall of the Khmer Rouge, news about what happened in Cambodia were very sparse. And I, I, I think many journalists at that time in West Germany were cautious because they didn't know whom to believe. And for the East Germans, it was a little bit difficult from 75 takeover Pol Pot, maybe up until 77 or 78, because formerly the East Germans still were on friendly terms with the Khmer Rouge. Right. However, the Khmer Rouge had already in 1975 kicked out the newly arrived GDR ambassador out of Phnom Penh. He had anticipated that he would have been welcomed by them mm. as a socialist communist brother. Uh, he wasn't. So um, he had to travel back to East Germany and the East German government from then onwards up until 1978 tried to establish communication with the Khmer Rouge through the embassy of the GDR in Laos. Right. And that didn't work. So they were always sending Christmas telegrams yeah. and, 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 and little letters acknowledging this and that. The Khmer Rouge never answered. Right. They never answered. And then 
in possibly 78 or late 77, the Vietnamese, who were very close to the GDR too, they started to rally the GDR to help the Vietnamese to overthrow the Khmer Rouge. Mm -hmm. And then actually the opinion on side on the side of the GD government changed and slow by slow information also leaked into the East German press. And then in 1979, once the Vietnamese had liberated, com occupied Cambodia, the GDR press were very eager to now demonstrate and verify and find proof for the atrocities of the Khmer Rouge to be able to justify the uh, liberation, occupation Invasion. of Cambodia <laughs> by Vietnam. Right. And when you one goes back and looks at the videos, documentaries, the work that came out, there, were, there, were, there was nothing between 75 and the end of 78, early 79. And it should be said that there were quite a few international mastheads, big magazines, and they completely ignored this country and what was going on, and they simply did not report on it. And I've been through those back copies, but what was reported basically came out of uh, communist Europe in those uh, early days. That's right, and um, it is also to know that it was not only communist Europe, but there was, for example, a Maoist splinter group operating out of Frankfurt, what was called the KBW, Kommunistischer Bund Westdeutschland, which translates into Communist Association West Germany. Mm -hmm. And they um, started to support the Khmer Rouge after their takeover. The story goes like that. There's a Maoist splinter group. They were short of international allies. They had written to almost everybody in the communist world and only Mugabe um, uh, and uh, Pol Pot, or the Khmer Rouge and Mugabe's government replied. So they started to support these two governments, and they did that throughout the Khmer Rouge rule in 79, and once the news broke that the Vietnamese had liberated, occupied, invaded Cambodia, they would start to rally for Pol Pot, and that actually led, and this is very strange, hmm. to um, a big donation of around 250,000 marks, which equals almost the same amount of dollar at that time, uh, 250,000 marks that were sent from Frankfurt to Beijing, reaching the Khmer Rouge, a cash donation to the Khmer Rouge. And now, uh, just understand here that Germany is also a post-genocide country, and yeah. it is very odd for um, educated, and there were educated German intellectuals to donate 250,000 marks to a genocidal murderer, such as Pol Pot, who can easily be compared with Adolf Hitler. Right. The, the comparisons have been there. I remember the people who supported the Anne Frank Trust, they organized translations of similar books out of uh, Cambodia. Genocide. I made a trip to Auschwitz a few years ago and I was asked, what do I do in Cambodia? And then when you tell them that uh, I've been covering the Khmer Rouge Tribunal since its inception, all of a sudden they open the doors and give you access to buildings, museum, artefacts, kind of what happened there. And the Ger what, I'm, what I'm driving at is that the Germans do have uh, a very deep sense for this country, given the genocide and what's happened. Yeah, right. And in the sense, it was really odd to see... Um German ultra left donating money to the Khmer Rouge. Again, they were in contact at this time. You, you might remember it. There was what was called the Stockholm Conference, uh, happening I think in 1981, where in Stockholm the uh, Swedish Cambodia Friendship Association mm -hmm. would invite uh, the Khmer Rouge to speak. Uh, Yang Tirit was there, addressing the audience, and that's also interesting to East German filmmakers. Back at that time, Hanowski Scheumann, who had done the first documentary after Khmer Rouge for the GDR by invitation of the Vietnamese, they went to that event in Stockholm and they told Yang Tirit that mm -hmm. they were West Germans. Right. So this is why she granted them an interview. 
Right. She would have she would not have granted an interview to East German colleagues at that time, which is again odd because the Khmer Rouge were communist, allegedly, mm -hmm. and Eastern Germany at that time was also communist. And just for the benefit of the listeners, Yang Tariq was uh, married to Yang Siri, Khmer Rouge foreign minister. She was a cabinet minister in her own right. Her sister was married to Pol Pot, and she was slated for prosecution in the Khmer Rouge tribunal, but she was ruled mentally unfit. Yeah, and what happened at that conference, she gives that interview, and it is part of the first documentary about the horrors of the Khmer Rouge, Kampuchea Death and Rebirth, a film produced by the GDR, mm -hmm. that later also went on to be displayed at the Moscow International Film Festival, won a prize there, and in this documentary, she um, explains the documentary filmmakers, for example, that allegations that the Khmer Rouge would have been would have killed all people who even wore glasses can't right. be true because she is also wearing glasses and she's still alive. Was it at that point uh, in Stockholm when they started blaming the Vietnamese for the atrocities that were committed under their regime? Yes, it was exactly that. It was a it was a moment where from seventy nine onwards, PR experts consulted these groups in uh, demonstrating to the world that the whole genocide that happened in Cambodia was basically a strategy of the Vietnamese to justify their invasion. And of course that was just complete made up nonsense. Sure. And it was interesting, many years later I would interview Q San Pan out at uh, his home before he was apprehended for trial. This was about 2001 or two. And he maintained the mantra, huh. you and Vietnamese, in a rather derogatory way. But I, I think that's still um, one of the problems, speaking here about memorialization and mm. memorials, that there is still a, a larger number of Cambodians who believe that the tool slang genocide memorial in Phnom Penh is basically uh, um, a Potemkin village. Right. set up by the Vietnamese to justify their invasion and um, people haven't been tortured and killed there by the thousands, which we know is true. So this is the problem is that there's still a fraction of people here in Cambodia who believe that the Vietnamese orchestrated a PR effort similar to what the mm -hmm. Nazis did in their concentration camps with the Red Cross. Khmer Rouge has been a recurring theme for Meta House over the years, books, films, more to come out, and I think Fraternal Health will be time to come out with the in 2025, which will also be the uh, the 50th anniversary of the end of the Vietnam War, as well as the uh, arrival of the Khmer Rouge, which heralded a vastly different landscape. But uh, on another note, what have been your favourite projects? I mean, you've done a lot with school villages. Some of my favourite work has been editing your scripts, which are basically uh, social contracts almost in terms of uh, teaching schoolboys how to behave around schoolgirls, don't drink and drive on your motorbikes, uh, all, all sorts of really basic things that go along with life, which uh, I think in most countries, it's the governments that produce these kinds of things. But in Cambodia, you've actually taken a lot of that on. Open House in 2007. In the beginning, hopes were high to get lots of young Cambodians in, uh, seeing art, watching films, attending performances. And we saw this really won't happen in high numbers. Sure, the space was also the space was too small to accommodate hundreds and thousands, was a small community center. But I also understood that if I want to talk to the youth, I have to go where they are. And yes, they are in schools. So since 2015, um, Matter House and the NGO that I'm representing, KDKG, we um, organize a school theater. I was a children's theater actor by myself when I was eight or nine, and I sort of liked it. So when I started to draft and, and develop project, as it always is, I came back to things I did when I was a kid that I enjoyed. And school theater and theater from kids for kids was something that I really liked and also found meaningful. It 
gave me something or taught me something. So we, we started to draft these projects and the Ministry of Education, Youth and Sports became a partner as early as in 2015, where in partnership with the Khmer Rouge Tribunal and a few donors, where we would be able to go into schools and perform theater and classrooms. And, and what started as a small project became a very big project. We had in the course of a few years around 100,000 students in these performances. They were highly liked, um, we, different possibly from other countries where school activities are not so much liked by students, where they wouldn't want to follow, where they disturb. Here we had an audience of 50 plus kids in the classroom plus 50 more peeping through the windows and um, that went on day for day and when we left the schools the, the kids would run after the performers and yell when are you coming to perform in our class so we really saw it something that spoke and still speaks to the kids so we we followed up the first project that was my Rouge legacy did another project where we spoke about uh, girl empowerment teaching young girls to study or learn a job before they're getting married in order to avoid that the husband leaves. That was a big one. one. I remember that well. And so it's difficult to explain the amount of young girls who are pregnant by 14 or 15. They don't finish their studies. The father of the child has disappeared. A lot of them wind up working in bars in Cambodia and they leave the child back in the village where their mother looks after their grandchild, and it's this constant cycle. And all these girls are very intelligent, they're very bright, but the opportunities are so limited. Right. If you go into schools, you still have the possibility to teach them how to speak out, to speak up in families um, on their own behalf, on behalf of their sisters, and to convince the parents that it's really important for the girls to learn something. So we continue to look at current problems in society and after the girl empowerment project we um, did a project on uh, drink driving and uh, alcohol abuse amongst teenagers mm -hmm. and that then because of COVID when the schools were all closed was turned into a film and an online learning module which are we still implementing in cooperation with a big um, CSR um, a donor. So from theater and classrooms, because of COVID, we moved to online learning and online teaching. And after COVID, we went partially back to live theater, but we still continue the online approach mm. in a country where internet proliferation is very high, yep. where many kids own smartphones and they use it. They use it mostly for entertainment, but then again, as we have that kind of edutainment approach, and the place we are producing, they're not heavy, they're child-friendly. Right. They, they have mostly a, a young protagonist in the middle, something that the kids can, or somebody the kids can the identify with. in the classroom. With. Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's entertaining to a certain uh, degree, and that is what makes it so appealing to, to mm. many youth here. And, and so from 2015 up until now, we're doing these projects outside of our cultural center, and they have been really proven to be a huge success. Well, one of the biggest criticisms of um, Cambodian artists has been that, it, particularly in the last five years, a little bit longer, is that uh, it lacks an edge. And it, in particular, it lacks a political edge, and that's got a bit to do with... Uh, government crackdown on uh, critics. But where would you like to see Cambodian artists go next? What direction would you like to see their work pushed towards? When we started Meta House, uh, the, the art scene was still in shambles, uh, was just resurrecting itself. Um, with the help of, as in many other Southeast Asian countries, uh, Cambodian artists returning uh, from the diaspora. Mm -hmm. And um, back then, lots of the art... Um, it was very one-dimensional. 
Yeah, and it, it, painters of rural scenes. And it also lacked concept because conceptual art or working with concepts or writing was still not very common among mm. artists. Many people who created, and that, that to a certain extent continues, they work based on their feelings. They don't really plan it out. And also, I think the, the overall Cambodian population still believes that art has to be something beautiful. So that means if, if you are painting a street kit, that can't be art because being a street kit is not beautiful. So um, it changed a little bit. It changed then after the first years because also NGOs were actually commissioning artists to work on NGO topics, safe access to water, uh, human trafficking, uh, yep. deforestation, whatever topic it was, there was always an NGO that commissioned artists to work around that same went for the filmmakers. So at some point, artists, they learn that it's not always about beauty, it's also about content. And it, it had, I think that was also the lesson for many artists, it had to be content, especially when you when you work with Westerners. Mm -hmm. It For Cambodian artists, it looked like when Westerners want something from them, it has to be built around a social issue. So that actually led them to moments, like example in film workshops, where I tried to encourage 30 kids to produce short films. And then in the workshop, the question was, if I give you now a budget, what would be the short film about? And the answer was, safe access to water, sir. Because they believed that this is what I wanted to hear. Right. But I, from a creative angle, rather would have liked the people to come up with their own ideas, their own creativity, their own stories, their own interests or whatever. So I think that is still the problem, that many Cambodian artists are not empowered enough to let out whatever is within them. It has something to do with the, the culture, uh, the societal contracts, what you are allowed to say. You're not basically allowed to criticize in Cambodia because a criticism would be considered rude. Self-censorship plays a role. The lack of understanding that sometimes a small story can be big. So it's, I mean, we all know that in sure. media or arts. It, it doesn't always have to be the big story. Sometimes a little anecdote, um, something that you encountered, that can make it. But Cambodian artists, Cambodian media makers often think that's not big enough. So I think in the moment we have, especially after COVID, where lots of artists had to leave the scene, had to give up making art because they were not able to support themselves, became online cosmetic sellers or soup kitchen operators. After COVID now, we have um, lots of young artists who basically look into sales. And in modern Cambodia, one thing that's very obvious is the real estate market that has blossomed and bloomed throughout the last years before COVID. So um, condo builders, real estate developers, they now make up for a large portion of customers for original art. So now most Cambodian artists, they deliver kind of a design approach. They will ask the condo developer, customer, what color the couch has in the condo in order to match it with the painting. Let the people who buy it and the audience judge that. But often it is not really creative. Right. And, and so again, for me, from a curator perspective, from the perspective of a person who's here for a long time, I had always wished that Cambodian artists and Cambodian filmmakers share with me what they want to share with me, share with me about their thoughts, their opinions, their wishes, their dreams. And that is often still not the case. Now I either get something that really looks nicely designed or I get um, a rural landscape or I get an NGO commissioned work by people who do something where they are not really 100% behind it. Mm -hmm. But what I want to say at the end of the day, 
only a few artists in this young Cambodia are able to thrill audiences abroad and here. And I, I think that's a tricky thing, yeah? To make people here happy and to also find the right language and the right meanings and, and media to talk to people abroad and communicate about modern Cambodia, art in Cambodia, how does it reflect uh, the contemporary society and so on. And therein lies the mission ahead. Nico Mesterham, thanks for the chat. It's been great. Thank you so much, Lou.